So with that introductory reading then, we uh, uh, look forward now to the words of uh, Tom, uh, speaking as he is on God has a solution for peace in the Middle East. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Brother Tony. Um, good evening, friends, brothers and sisters. It's really lovely to be with you. And I'm um, and thank you for thank you for inviting me to speak um, this evening. We've got what I think is a is a really interesting and very timely uh, topic to consider this evening. God has a solution for peace in the Middle East. Um, and we we can't but turn on our televisions, um, open our news apps on our phones, or if you still buy newspapers, open your newspaper without seeing some reference to the conflict between um, between Israel and Gaza that has been that has been raging um, for nearly six months now. And it started back in October. Um, and that war has been has been raging fiercely um, for for six months nearly, and man seems completely powerless to um, to solve that problem, doesn't he? Um, we've seen attempts um, to to, um, to 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 provide a solution to that, um, but they've all they've all failed. Um, and what we're going to spend some time doing this evening um, is is considering that actually where man has failed, God will succeed. He has a permanent solution for peace in the Middle East. So if my slides are working, let's have a look. Right, I'm just gonna have to minimize myself. So, right, hopefully you can still, hopefully you can still see me. Right, um, this is how we're going to, this is how we're gonna break our, our thoughts up uh, together this evening. I've broken it into five sections. So first of all, we're going to think about the the Middle East and the conflict, not just the not, conflict that's waging at the moment, but the conflicts that have been present since Israel was established as a state in 1948. And it might feel a bit like a history lesson. So I do I do apologize. Um, I do apologize in advance. Um, and we're going to continue that history lesson um, on point number two, where we're going to see that man has tried many times um, to find solutions to the the uh, um, the conflicts, the wars that have been raging in the Middle East over the years, um, and their solutions have all failed, or they've only been they've only been temporary solutions, a sticking plaster, if you like. They've not been able to completely solve um, the the problems. Hence why we hence why we have a conflict um, ongoing at the moment. We're then going to turn our attention to to our to our scriptures, and we're going to we're going to look at this. Um, in three three ways we're going to see that actually the creator and the sustainer of the heavens and the earth the one true god is acutely interested in what's going on in the middle east and that seems funny doesn't it that um, there's this tiny tiny uh, land of israel um, and you think what does the god of heaven and earth care about that well actually he cares deeply um, about what's going on and this will bring us on to our fourth section, which is that he has a solution for peace. And unlike man's solutions, this will be a permanent and a lasting solution, which will bring us to our final point, um, point number five. That actually, this is not just something that concerns the, the people of the Middle East and the nation of Israel. Actually, this is something that we, you know, thousands of miles from that, that place, um, and indeed everybody around the world, should be interested in too because it has a uh, it has a, a very important uh, significance for us. So that's our plan. Um, some of the sections will be longer than others. Some of the sections will be shorter than others. So please, the first one's a bit long. So please don't be thinking we're going to be here all all evening. I promise. I promise you we won't. Right. Let's get into this then. Um, I I am not a historian. And I am not particularly well versed in the history of um, the Middle East, or more specifically, the history of the state of Israel. So it's so it's been something of a of a learning journey for me um, pulling this pulling this talk together. So you'll you'll have to bear with me if I get some of the details um, slightly slightly wrong. Um, go e go easy on me. But it's been fascinating, and the first thing that struck me. Um, 
friends, brothers and sisters, is if you look at this list that's on the screen, and I apologize, it's just a page of text. This is just the key conflicts, the key wars that have been um, wage, uh, been waged since <laughs> the state of Israel was established in 19, 1948. So what are we going back? 75 years, um, just over. Um, there's a list of 10 there on the on the screen. Some of them are full blown wars. Some of them are um, they're not wars, but they're they're conflicts. Um, but that's quite a big list, isn't it? For a for a, a country that is less than seven, uh, just over 75 years old. Um, that's quite a lot. There's 10. There's 10 on the screen and we're going to go through them. We're not going to. We're going to spend ages on each. Um, we'll we'll spend a bit of time on on some. Um, but what I'm hoping to demonstrate is that the land of Israel has been at war with its neighbours almost non-stop since the state of Israel was established in 1948. Um, okay, so let's start then. Immediately in 1948, upon the establishment of um, of the state of the state of Israel. So um, a lot of text on the screen. I, I might just sort of summarize for you. As many of you as many of you will perhaps not uh, perhaps not recall, but you will have you will have heard before. State of Israel was established on uh, the 14th of May 1948. And there were a lot of Arab nations that were very unhappy about this. So the very next day, the 15th of May, um, a coalition of Arab states, and you can see them listed on the screen, Egypt, Transjordan, Syria, um, and Iraq invaded. They entered, they entered Palestine, the land that had been given to, uh, to, uh, to Israel, and immediately started attacking the Israeli forces. And I should point out that this is not a, the, the purpose of this talk is not to kind of take sides or, or to make political statements. Um, so we'll be a, as objective as we can throughout this. Um, but the Israelis were, I don't know whether we could say unprepared, but they'd just been established as a state, as a nation, as a country. And they found themselves having to defend themselves um, from this, this uh, attack from their Arab, their Arab neighbours. And you'd have thought, well, the, the, the outcome is certain. They're going to be, they're going to be completely destroyed immediately. Well, actually, the fighting lasted for 10 months and the outcome wasn't perhaps what what some might have predicted. Um, instead of Israel being completely um, overturned, um, the opposite happened. Actually, um, Israel not only uh, ended up or continued to control the area that had been um, allotted to them, they also went on to take, um, as you can see on the screen, 60% of the area that had been proposed uh, for the the Arab state, and there's some there's some areas listed there. Importantly, the, the bottom bullet point, they also took control of West Jerusalem. All of that to say, this set the tone for Israel in the land. You know, the very next day after this nation was established, um, they found themselves at at war. Um, war number one. Um, the Suez Crisis, 19, 1956. So we're we're eight years later. We're not even ten years after um, the establishment of the State of Israel, and we're on to what's what's become known as the Second Arab-Israeli War. Um, so we're already on to War Number Two within eight years of Israel being established as a as a nation. And um, this this crisis, as the name suggests, um, was centered on the Suez, um, the Suez Canal. And um, it was the start of a lot of um, animosity between Israel and Egypt. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to see over the next couple of slides that actually Egypt um, and Israel found themselves at loggerheads and indeed at war. Um, until um, until there was some element of peace um, agreed agreed between them, but Israel um, were perturbed by the Egyptian president nationalising the Suez Canal, and so along with Britain and France, um, they uh, they decided to take military military action, um, and it, it's become 
um, a famous, uh, infamous um, crisis um, in uh, in the history of uh, of the state of Israel and its Arab nation, uh, Arab neighbors. Right, the Six Day War. Um, this happened shortly um, shortly after. Um, so we're up to we're up to 1967. So where are we now? I'm going to have to make sure my maths is on form. But we're not even 20 years now, are we, into the establishment of the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, and we're on to the third Arab-Israeli war. And you can see the point that I'm trying to make here. This is a land that is almost um, constantly at at war um, and here we go we've got another another kind of battle another confrontation another war between israel and some of her arab neighbors egypt syria and jordan and again this was the egyptian president president nasser who we're gonna we'll see a picture of him in a few a few slides time um, and it was all about trade routes and israeli ships um, and israel could see where this was going um, he was mobilizing um, his military along the, the border with Israel. And so Israel decided that they would take uh, preemptive action. And uh, they, as you can see by the text, if you're able to, to follow it as I'm reading, I know there's a lot on the screen, but um, they were caught by surprise, the Egyptians. And actually they found that their um, a lot of their air force was, um, was, uh, was destroyed. And uh, Israel was able to also launch a ground offensive um, and march march into the Sinai Peninsula, and this was um, you know, this this really caught Egypt by surprise, and so there was a ceasefire, um, and this and and hence this uh, within within six days, and hence this war became known as the uh, the six day the six day war. But but there we go, we're on to the third war in less than twenty years, nineteen seventy three. The fourth, I think this is the, I think this is the final one that's referred to as an Arab-Israeli war. I, I think um, this is the fourth Arab-Israeli war, 1973. So that's 25 years. Four, um, four Arab-Israeli wars in 25 years. That's something, isn't it? And you, you, you may have heard of this, of this war. You may, you may recall it. Um, Yom Kippur is a day that we may we may know we we may know it as the day of atonement um which is one of the uh, one of the holy days in the jewish the jewish calendar um and uh, as such um the people of israel uh, those who observed at, at, at least these um these religious these religious dates um were somewhat caught off guard um because this is a special day for them, and the Egyptian and Syrian forces um, broke through, crossed through their ceasefire lines, um, and uh, and waged war on Israel. Um, but but isn't it interesting, um, friends, brothers, and sisters, um, that if you read that last bullet point there on the screen, the Israeli military launched a counteroffensive, and by the twenty fourth of of October. Um, so 18 days after the initial uh, incursion, they had improved their positions and, and actually look, they they reached within 62 miles, uh, within 100 kilometers of the Egyptian capital of, uh, of Cairo. And the, the point of this talk is not to um, necessarily um, talk about um, how, how God was on the side of, of Israel during these things, but we can see the hand of the almighty, can't we? Um, in uh, in in these uh, in these wars and how God uh, fights for his uh, his people. We won't spend a long time on um, looking at these on the Lebanon the Lebanon wars because there are, there are a couple of them, um, but this to me shows um, fighting on a different front. So fighting on on the the northern the northern side um, on on the border uh, between Israel and Lebanon, and it's something that. You know, we're seeing we're seeing at the moment we're seeing a, um, a lot of tension um, between uh, between Lebanon and uh, and Israel. But this 1982 war was the first this first kind of major major warfare between uh, between the two of them. Um, I'm, I'm not proposing to go into a lot of detail just to just to kind of show that you know 
Israel has had to wage war with a lot of her a lot of her neighbours. I'll perhaps rephrase: Israel has um, waged war with a lot of a lot of her neighbours. And the last point I found quite interesting on the screen. So even though this war only lasted for for three years, I mean that's quite a long time, isn't it, to be fighting a war? Um, actually, it led to it led to tensions and this this almost guerrilla warfare for a period of a further 15 years so actually for 18, 18 years, years. that you know the war might have only been going on for three years but actually the um the ramifications um and the tensions and indeed some of the fighting um went on for much much longer <clears throat> right these these next two are quite interesting because these aren't really wars these are what are called the Palestinian uprisings, or my pronunciation is probably going to be terrible, intifadas. Um, you can see on the first bullet point there, um, which means shaking off um, in Arabic, I, I understand. So um, you kind of get the idea of what these are about. This is the Palestinian, um, the Palestinians wishing to shake off um, Israeli, what they would view as Israeli, uh, Israeli oppression. And this was a this was an interesting period of of conflict because it wasn't uh, it wasn't traditional warfare and it perhaps wasn't completely violent but it was it was significant uh, a period of significant tension so protests civil disobedience. Um, graffiti, throwing stones, Molotov cocktails, all of that kind of um, demonstrations of dissatisfaction and a heightening of tensions um, that just kept that kind of um, that tension in place between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This, when we get to 2000, um, that was probably when I, how old was I then? I was 12. And at that point, that was probably when I started to, this started to kind of reach my consciousness um, I started to become conscious of this stuff because I would see it on the news and it was this second Palestinian uprising which was when we started to get suicide bombings um, they became particularly common and you might you might be able to cast your mind back to that time when you know it was almost like you couldn't turn on the news um, you know from week to week without there being another suicide bomb um, it just seemed to happen all the time um and uh and you know this if you if you look at this first kind of bullet point at the top this was between um kind of around five five years that this that this these tensions these tensions lasted so you know a significant length of time albeit not a not a full-on kind of traditional warfare with um you know tanks and soldiers uh you know invading one another um but nonetheless, a period of intense, uh, intense violence. Um, second Lebanon war, Lebanon war. I'm not going to go into any details on that because we will completely run out of time. 2021 was an interesting time because this was where tensions began to kind of tick up again um, between Hamas and uh, and Israel. And you might recall this was when there were all these rockets being fired toward Israel. So that third bullet point down there, I'm not sure quite how accurate that figure is, um, around, let's call it four and a half thousand, um, somewhere between four and four and a half thousand Palestinian rockets uh, coming into, into the land of Israel. And that's when that's when Israel has its um, you know, its iron dome that it uses to, to kind of shoot down those those missiles. But that, if you like, set the scene for what we've what we currently we're currently observing this israel gaza war and um you, you don't need me to kind of walk you through what happened because you you'll be you'll be very well acquainted with it but um starting off the 7th of october was when hamas launched this surprise attack something like three thousand uh, militants crossing over um crossing over into uh, into israel on the southern the southern side and uh and killing a large number of israelis and taking hostages and in fact a number of those hostages um are still are still uh we we understand um uh 
are, are still in that, that same situation. They're still being held hostage um, by uh, by Hamas. And Israel is, has declared war on Hamas, hasn't it? And um, has, has invaded uh, Gaza and has been, as I kind of alluded to at the start of the... Um, other side of the talk um has been has been waging this war for um for nearly nearly six months uh nearly six months now so i said it wasn't gonna be a history lesson but that kind of was a history lesson wasn't it um and i'm sure you've had better history lessons uh in your in your time but all of that to show um to demonstrate that since israel has been established as a state um it has been at war um a significant amount of time with its uh, with its neighbours, and this is something that um, God knew would would happen in his in his infinite wisdom, his foresight. Um, he knew that uh, that this is how these people, um, Israel and her her, her Arab neighbours, um, would uh, would coexist. Um, if you've got your Bibles with you, please just turn to Genesis twenty. With me, we'll, all, all the references will be on the screen, but um, you know, please feel free to turn them up if you if you'd like. So this we're going back thousands of years uh, from from uh, from today, and you think, well, what can the relevance of uh, of, of uh, something written thousands of years ago be to today? Well, it's extremely relevant because um, God uh, predicted, prophesied. That um, that these that this conflict would be a feature for Israel and uh, and her, her her Arab relatives, her Arab brethren. Um, we are going to go in at verse twenty one and read to verse twenty three, and the context here is that uh, Isaac, one of the patriarchs, and his wife uh, Rebecca are expecting a baby and uh or, or rather twins um, as we'll we'll come on to to read and um rebecca was in significant discomfort in her in her pregnancy um verse 21 isaac entreated the lord for his wife because she was barren and the lord was entreated of him and rebecca his wife conceived and the children struggled together within her and she said if it be so why am i thus and she went to inquire of the lord let's just pause there for for a moment so here's rebecca um barren so she couldn't have children until isaac um until isaac uh, entreated the lord for her and then when she is with child um presumably she just thought it was one child at the time but she has got such uh discomfort um she's in so much pain um, during this pregnancy that she says i'm gonna i'm gonna have to go and i'm gonna have to go and speak to god about this because i i don't know what's going on uh, in my body uh, the lord said unto her verse 23 two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger um, and doesn't that doesn't that tell us all we need to know um brothers and sisters friends about the current conflict that we're that we're seeing two nations are in thy womb these are not these are not two brothers these are two nations two manner of people they are very different and they shall be separated from thy bowels that's exactly right isn't it um these people do not view uh, one another as uh, as brothers as family um there is significant conflict between them and the struggling that started in uh, in Rebecca's womb um, has uh, has continued uh, between her her her, her children, um, Isaac, uh, sorry, uh, Jacob and uh, and Esau, uh, and of course the descendants of Esau um, and the descendants of uh, of Ishmael. Right, I said the first section would be long. The other sections are not as long as that. Don't you don't you worry. Let's move on to section number two, though, because what we want to demonstrate here, what we want to show is that man's solutions have either failed or have been temporary. Um, they have not led to lasting peace um, between Israel and uh, and her Arab, uh, her Arab neighbors. So on the screen there, um, a picture. This was taken um, 
during what's become known as the Camp David Accords. And uh, as you'll, you'll see uh, something that becomes a common theme, you have an American president, so in this case, uh, Jimmy Carter, flanked by the Israeli prime minister and the Egyptian president, and that, I believe, is President Nasser. Um, so this was five years or so after the Yom Kippur War. And, uh, you know, you'll recall as we were going through those wars that um, uh, that um, Egypt were a, a key kind of protagonist in that, in those wars uh, between between Israel um, and and her neighbours. And this this uh, these Camp David Accords, they did lead to a peace agreement and it, and it has largely held, hasn't it, between Israel uh, and and Egypt, but it hasn't stopped violence between Israel and her other neighbours. Um, let's move on to the second one here. Um, this, as far as I can tell, is the next one, uh, the next kind of formal peace uh, peace process, or rather peace conference. So this is the Middle East Peace Conference, and this photo was taken in Madrid in 1991. <laughs> And I understand that this was the first direct negotiations between Israel and its Arab neighbours. That quite how you can have direct negotiations between all these people uh, on that photo, I don't know. Um, I don't know how you can have any kind of constructive discussion with all those people involved. But um, it seems that they discussed something. And this in and of itself, although it laid groundwork for, for some of the future diplomatic efforts, it did not achieve peace. So all these people gathered together, um, I'm sure very, very important, very powerful people from very important and powerful countries, um, co-sponsored, as you can see on the screen, by the US and the Soviet Union, but it couldn't bring, uh, it couldn't bring peace uh, and certainly not lasting peace. Right, we're gonna see this chap a couple of times um, in the next few slides because, uh, President Bill Clinton um, took it upon himself, as a number of American presidents have done, to try and bring peace to. And the photo on the screen here was taken in 1993 at what has become known as the Oslo Accords. And um, you'd think, wouldn't you, from this photo that uh, it'd been a great success. There's uh, some smiling faces, or at least. Uh, at least on two of the two of the three people, there there are some smiles, um, and and it seemed all positive. It seemed like this was going to be a a breakthrough. There was going to be peace between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, but that wasn't that wasn't the case, was it? Um, and those those talks eventually uh, broke down over things like, as you can see on the screen, Israeli settlements, Palestinian terrorism, and the status of Jerusalem, and it's that that last one, the status of Jerusalem, that has become a key sticking point um, in many of these uh, many of these negotiations. Here he is again, Bill Clinton. So we're um, we're a few years later, seven years later, um, at what's become known as the Camp David Summit, um, and he's uh, he's accompanied again by Yasser Arafat. We've got a different Israeli Prime Minister. This is Ehud Barak. And again, we had the same problem. Um, so the summit, uh, the summit ended without agreement, and both sides blamed the other for the breakdown in talks. Right, this one you might recall because this only happened a few years ago. Um, this was when um, Trump was was president of a, of the uh, of the state of the United States, and he, along with his uh, son-in-law Jared Kushner led what became known as the Abraham Accords. And uh, these these seemed to be something of a breakthrough because it, it meant that, well, because of these efforts, it led to a number of Arab countries, and you can see them on the screen, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, officially recognising the state of Israel and agreeing to do trade with them, which is um, a significant step from where where they were before however it's not brought lasting peace has it because that's we, that's certainly not what we're experiencing at the moment and actually a number of arab nations who haven't signed these uh abraham accords if that's what they're called these agreements they think it's going to have a negative impact 
on on Israeli Palestinian conflict and uh, weaken the Palestinians' bargaining power. Right. So what's happening at the moment? Well, I think Qatar are trying to lead um, peace talks um, for for the current the current war uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. I've not been plain sailing. So this uh, this screenshot was taken from BBC News um, just over a week ago. Israel downplays truce prospects after Hamas response. And um, you can see there from the quote on the, the right hand side, um, Mr. Netanyahu, so Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, office said the proposals were unrealistic. That's Hamas's proposals. And Hamas wants a permanent end to the war and full Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, which is not what uh, the Israelis, or certainly what, not what Mr. Netanyahu is after. And then if you've been following the news, you'll see here, um, so hopefully you can actually read that. It's a bit unclear on my screen. Um, the headline is from the Financial Times, Russia and China veto US res resolution calling for immediate Gaza ceasefire. Um, and this was this was just two days ago uh, on the 22nd of, of March, where you, you, you may recall that the US wanted a, an immediate ceasefire um, but they said that that in order for that to be the case, Hamas must release all its hostages. Um, and this was vetoed by Russia and China, who, although they want an immediate ceasefire, um, they are not um, pushing for the release of hostages at the same time. And um, all this to demonstrate, brothers and sisters, friends, that man is really struggling to find even a temporary solution to, uh, to this warfare, let alone... Um, let alone a lasting and permanent solution. Right, third section. God is acutely interested in the Middle East. Um, some of these verses, well, sorry, all of these verses are lovely. Um, turn turn them up if you if you'd like, but I'll read them. I'll read them to you because God is acutely interested, as you can see on the screen, in the Middle East, and more specifically, He's acutely interested in the people of Israel, the land of Israel, um, and in particular, Jerusalem. Um, you can see Zion on the on the screen, which is a, a something of a synonym for, um, for Jerusalem. We read in Psalm 87, verse 2, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Isn't that interesting? That the creator of the heavens and the earth um, in all his um, might and his power and his splendor and his and his greatness loves this place zion he loves jerusalem um that's that's emotive and strong language isn't it and it carries on in psalm 132 verse 13 and 14 um it builds on this for the lord hath chosen zion he hath desired it for his habitation this is my rest forever here will i dwell for i have desired it um, twice there we read about god desiring this place he's chosen it to be his habitation where the god of creation is going to dwell isn't that remarkable that this uh, this place uh, this tiny place in the middle east um, is what god has chosen the place god has chosen for his habitation in 2 Kings 21, verse 7, he says, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So God loves Jerusalem. Um, he's chosen it for his habitation. It's, his, it's the place that he will put his name forever. So this is not just um, any, other pl any other place. Um, the headlines we see, the the news stories, they are not just of passing interest to uh, to us or indeed to God. God is um, in uh, in Jerusalem and the land of Israel, and He has a solution for peace. Unlike mankind, He has a lasting, He has a permanent solution for peace. And perhaps you just turn this one up um, with me, um, Luke chapter. So one, verse thirty-one to thirty-three, words that we probably find ourselves coming back to quite a lot. Um, 
from this this platform on a on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening. And this was when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was um, with child or that she was going to be with child. And this wasn't going to be um, just any any other uh, or any old child. This was going to be the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Um, the angel says to Mary, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Um, and what I wanted to draw from from these verses, the point I wanted to make is that God has plans to appoint a new ruler in Israel. So at the moment, we've got Benjamin Netanyahu, and we may well get somebody else in the future. I don't I don't know. But God has a plan to establish his son. Excuse me, um, the Lord Jesus uh, in Israel. Um, Look at that, that verse, verse 32. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And King David, King David's throne was in Jerusalem, wasn't it? Um, and God has a has a new king to go on this throne. The, these words that we've got on the screen, these words that we're reading here, they haven't yet been fulfilled. Um, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. So God has plans to establish a new ruler, a new king in Israel, and his kingdom is going to, and his reign is going to be forever. Look at the, these verses. I don't think I've ever paid full attention to these. Uh, we hear them at certain times of the year, perhaps. But just look at some of the attributes of this, of this king um, and of his kingdom. We read in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So we're, we're thinking about the government of Jesus here, his rulership, um, when he's established as king in, uh, in Jerusalem. And his name shall be called Ancient Wonderful, be called Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yeah. Isn't that telling? So this king will become known as the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. OK, so he's going to have um, uh, an everlasting reign, an everlasting government. And a key feature of that is going to be peace. Uh, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Um, and look at this, these, this last sentence, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And um, that's comforting for us, isn't it? Um, thousands of years later, uh, or thousands of years on from when these words were originally spoken, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This kingdom is going to be a place of peace. Um, we read Isaiah chapter 2 in the first five verses, and verse 4 speaks about something that's horribly unimaginable, inconceivable for us today. He, we believe that's speaking about about Jesus when he returns, shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isn't that a far cry from where we are today, not just in the Middle East, but around the world? To, you know, in the Middle East, it's, it's a struggle enough to get a ceasefire and to get peace in place let alone to have people give up their arsenals, turn their weapons into agricultural instruments um, and not to learn war anymore. You've got to be completely convinced that there's going to be no need for warfare in the future, haven't you? Um, but that is what um, our Bibles tell us um, the, the future, um, this future kingdom will be like. 
And it's not just amongst the, the nations that there'll be peace. Look at this. Um, children um, will be able to play without fear. Zechariah 8, verses 4 and 5 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. These the, the, the streets of Jerusalem, which for so many years have been have been um riddled with violence, haven't they? Um certainly not a not a safe place where you would just be happy to let your children play and you, you know, you can leave them to it and come back and get them later. Um, but old men and old women will dwell in the streets. Um and they will be full of boys and girls playing. And look at this. It's not just it's not just people, it's animals as well that will that will be at peace. So um so true is that um is that uh, are those words that we read in Isaiah about Jesus being the prince of peace um and of uh, of peace um being uh, 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 there'll be no being no end of peace. Um, it's going to even apply to the animals. Let's just read these verses together. Isaiah 11, verse 6 to 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. The wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, and, and that last verse, verse nine, just sums it up so beautifully, doesn't it? Um, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. That, that Mount Zion, where this kingdom um, uh, begins, um, will be a place of peace, not a place for hurt or for destruction final section thank you everybody for being so patient um we are on our our last or perhaps our penultimate slide now because this is something that we should be interested in um this is not just something that concerns the people of israel and those living in the middle east this is something that has huge significance and relevance to us because um this eternal peace that we've been thinking about will not just will not just be on mount zion not just in jerusalem not just in israel not just between israel and her neighbors but actually this eternal peace will ultimately fill the whole earth it will fill uh cardiff um it will fill um birmingham where, where i am at the moment um, we read in daniel chapter 2 verse 44 about the about the expansion of Christ's kingdom. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So even though it starts um, at Jerusalem, it will ultimately, um, it will ultimately uh, take over um, the, the whole earth. It will cover, it will cover the whole earth. Um, God's heavenly kingdom will, and um, we we couldn't we couldn't finish without without this this verse from Habakkuk chapter two, could we? Because this um, this backs up that point that this is something that's not just not just um, kind of confined to the to the Middle East or to or to the land of Israel. This is something that will uh, fill the whole earth. We read, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this has um, a, a great deal of interest to us, um, friends, brothers and sisters, because um, this kingdom will uh, will fill the whole earth and um, we have the opportunity to, um, to, 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 to be subjects um, and potentially even to be kings and priests um, with, with the Lord Jesus in that day. Um, when Jesus, um, before he before he ascended um, to heaven, after he after he'd been raised from the dead, um, he instructed his uh, his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
but he that believeth not shall be damned. And that salvation, um, that salvation, that, that glorious, glorious kingdom to come, that reign of peace um, is something that we can uh, we can have a part of, too, um, in God's uh, God's good grace and mercy. So um, that's all I have to say. I hope it's uh, I hope you found it interesting. And um, yeah, what a wonderful hope it is that we that we have um, centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.